we make promises about how to be together and how to be in the world. We also fall short of honoring those promises, inviting us to repair and strengthen the strands of community. The choice to mend broken strands of the web is an act of faithfulness. The liturgist for this service, Reverend Erica Hewitt, is the UUA Minister of Worship Arts. She coordinated a wide range of worship and music leaders for you to enjoy, including original songs composed just for this service. We welcome all to join us as we explore our Unitarian Universalist faith, a faith which draws us into a community of justice seekers with a commitment to lifelong spiritual growth and compassionate service to the community. Whoever you are, whoever you love, you are welcome here. You are welcome here, regardless of your color, your national origin, gender, sexual orientation, age, physical or mental abilities, economic status, or religious background. Families, we're so happy that you could be with us today. Later, when we sing this little light of mine, the children are welcome to meet our child care folks out in the foyer for children's activities. As a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we're a non-creedal community and do not subscribe to a specific set of beliefs. We live by a covenant that encourages ethical behavior, affirms democracy, celebrates the worth of every individual, and unites us in a search for truth and meaning. We welcome you. For more information about our congregation, you can go to orlandouu.org, or you can email info at orlandouu.org. We have some special announcements for you. The green team will be meeting today from noon to two. All ages, genders, members, and friends are welcome. We'll start the meeting off with a presentation introducing your eighth principal team. Afterwards, Debbie and Craig will continue to lead our discussion of the UUA Green Sanctuary 2030 initiative and how we at WNU can meet its requirements. The meeting will be in the assembly room over in the Enrichment Center and over Zoom. So for more information, you can contact Mary Deboy at greenteam at orlandouu.org. Primary elections are coming up on August 23rd. We're looking for helpers to come and set up Gore Hall across the patio and to sign up to bring the food and the snacks for our election volunteers. The election volunteers will be in Gore Hall from 6 a.m. and finish the day when the last voter has submitted their vote. Please come help and support them. All of our other announcements are on slides before and after the service. They all have links in our weekly update or on the website. And you can sign up for the weekly update with Gabby, our program assistant. Thank you again for being here in person or online. Let us begin. You are a miracle in motion. I greet you with wonder. In a world which seeks to own your joy and your imagination, you have chosen to be free every day as a practice. I can never know the struggles you went through to get here but I know you have swum upstream. 
and at times it has been lonely. I want you to know I honor the choices you made in solitude, and I honor the work you have done to belong. I honor your commitment to that which is larger than yourself, and your journey to love the particular container of life that is you. You are enough. Your work is enough. You are needed. Your work is sacred. You are here. And I am grateful. You are enough. You are needed. You are here and I am grateful. If you are experiencing this worship service in community, I invite you to greet one another using one of those phrases or a similar phrase. You might be opening up the chat and chatting it to the whole group or to someone you know. You might be leaving it in the comments. If you are sitting on your couch with someone, you might turn and say this to them. You are enough. You are needed. You are here and I am grateful. Now, if you're not experiencing this worship service in real time in community, you still have a community. So feel free to pick up your phone and text someone these words or DM someone these words. Pick anyone who you want to say these words to. You are enough or you are needed or you are here and I am grateful. And if it's you who needs most to receive these words, say them silently to yourself or imagine all of us saying them to you. You are enough. You are needed. You are here and we are grateful. Please greet one another. When I was younger, I enjoyed using multiple colors of embroidery floss to create friendship bracelets. Remembering the act of pulling each string into the other reminds me of the relationships we build together in our congregations and our wider association. Though our theologies, identities, and lived experiences vary, we choose to come together because we share a common vision. And just as when one of the threads fray a little and I gently pull it back into the pattern, so too do we call each other back into relationship when we inevitably fail to live up to our principles, values, and covenants. Friends, beloveds, may the light of our chalice illuminate the paths we are on and remind us that though our paths are many, we travel side by side for our dreams and goals are woven together. Please join me in the words of our chalice. In the light of truth and in the warmth of love, we gather to seek, to sustain, and to share.
connected breath you and me we're all connected bird cloud and tree we're all connected bird cloud and tree we're all connected earth wind and sea we're all connected earth wind and sea Breath you and me. We're all connected. We're all connected. Bird cloud and tree. Bird cloud and tree. We're all connected. We're all connected. Earth, wind and sea. Earth, wind and sea. Woven in a single garment of destiny. We're all connected. We're all Connected you and me, breath you and me. We're all connected, we're all connected. Bird cloud and tree, bird cloud and tree. We're all connected, we're all connected. Earth, wind and sea, earth, wind and sea. Woven in a single garment of destiny, we're all connected. We're all Connected. Breath you and me. Breath you and me. We're all connected. We're all connected. Breath you. Sage and Unitarian Universalism, we talk about how we are all connected. And when I say that all people in the world are connected, what do you what do you think about that, or what does it bring up for you? Um, I think it brings up uh, like if some, everyone connected in the world, like that trees is it touching. Like if one cheese here and one cheese there. Right. So even though we can't tell that the roots of trees are touching, they're still touching and yeah. they're still connected. And so that reminds you of how people are all connected. Yeah. And what are some ways in which we are all connected? Can you um, give me like an example? Like if we're best friends or um, family. So best friends and families can be connected. Yeah, what about what I do can impact other people, right? So if I'm in a classroom and I sneeze, achoo, but I don't cover my nose or my mouth with my elbow, what can happen to my friends in the classroom? Um, they can get germs. Yeah, they can get my germs. So even though I say, no, I'm okay, I don't need a tissue, I don't need to cover my mouth, what should I do? Um, you should cover your mouth even though you don't want to. Right, because what I do can impact other people because we are all connected. Awesome. Thank you. Mm. Bye. So, Bradshaw, in Unitarian Universalism, we often talk about this interconnected web in which we are all a part of. Can you kind of share with me your thoughts on the interconnectedness of all of us during this time in history? Not only do I think that humanity is a thing that connects us together, I also think it's experiences and what we've been through. So I always thought growing up that we were all connected, but I really felt like there was no way to share that or, or, or prove that. Like I felt like what I did impacted other people. And there were always those people who were like, the only thing that matters is what I do because I am the only person that it bothers. But then when we had COVID, 
that was a clear example <laughs> that we are all connected because what I do impacts everyone else. So COVID started with one person and now we saw this worldwide pandemic because people weren't washing their hands or wearing masks or social distancing or whatever you want to say they were or were not doing. But it clearly showed that we are connected and what one of us does clearly impacts everyone else. So if I tear down a rainforest in some tropical location, it will impact people on the other side of the world. So what we do does matter, like not just for us, but for those outside of our sphere. So Bradshaw, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's true, but in the instance that you brought up with the trees being cut down, I think not only that connects us humans, but also us creatures of earth, mm. as that will affect the animals and the ecosystem. Oh, that's really good. I was only thinking it of it as in terms of mankind, but I guess the interconnected web in which we are all apart also applies to um, animals and and trees and, and whatnot. Hmm. I really like that. A beautiful quilt hangs on the wall in my home office where I now spend so much of my time, including taping many of my recordings. It was made by Unitarian Universalist Jennifer Centric, then a member of the First UU Church of Youngstown, Ohio, where I served as minister. I hung it up early in the pandemic when I realized that little office would be the place where I would spend most of my days. The quilt brings me joy. The cacophony of rainbow colors signify welcome and inclusion. Each triangle brings its own bright beauty, a celebration of the individuality of each person. And there's a whimsical line of stitching that runs throughout and along the quilt's border, bringing a feeling of playfulness and the joy that is present in belonging. As a whole, the quilt reminds me of how we are all stitched together an expression of our fundamental interdependence. If there's one thing the last two years of pandemic have taught us, it's the reality of our inescapable interconnectedness, experiencing wave after wave of COVID-19 spreading quickly across the globe reminds us that our lives are inextricably woven together. Early in the pandemic, we learned to wear masks, understanding that I wear my mask to protect you and you wear your mask to protect me. We rely on one another and we can act to protect one another or our actions can put each other at more risk. As Unitarian Universalists, we have long articulated the importance of interdependence. We name it in our principles. We know it from our understanding of science and biology, and we understand it as Universalists who reject ideologies of supremacy rooted in notions of the saved and the damned, instead embracing the worth and dignity of every person and the knowledge that no one is outside the circle of love. We know we belong to each other, and we belong to the earth and the web of creation itself. So what does this reality of our interdependence mean for our theology? Well, it's reflected in one of the ways we describe Unitarian Universalism. We say we are not a creedal tradition, but a covenantal one. We don't have a creed which all must profess. We don't all believe the same things about the nature of God or gods, or even share the same religious background. But what does bind us? The promises we make to one another about how we will live together in community and how we will live together in our larger world. You see, as Unitarian Universalists, a far more important question than what do you believe is how are we to live? And we answer this question through covenant. Covenant is our religious response to our fundamental interdependence because we are interconnected, because we belong to each other, our religious and moral impulse guides us to make promises to nurture the threads of our connection with justice and compassion and equity. Now, early formulations of covenant were understood as among believers with their God. But over the centuries, the influence of Unitarianism, Universalist theology, along with humanism, have reoriented our notions of covenant to be rooted in our relationships with one another, our wider humanity, and creation itself. 
We are a tradition concerned with the here and now and the conditions of people's lives today. One powerful example of this is how our principles are articulated as a covenant. We covenant to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of all people. We covenant to create practices that nurture justice and abiding compassion into the fabric of human relations. We covenant to join our efforts to work for a world where the web of life is infused with peace, justice, and equity, such that all people can thrive in their wholeness. The Universalists called this aspiration the kingdom of God. Today, we call it the beloved community. Covenant is a centerpiece of our theology because it calls us to practice and live our deepest values and the greatest aspirations we have for ourselves, humanity, and our world. Now, it's not about checking boxes and getting everything right. It's deeply spiritual work. It requires humility, listening, forgiveness, and open-heartedness. Because we are human, we don't live our promises perfectly. But covenant teaches us how to seek forgiveness from one another and ourselves, and it teaches us how to heal and come back together. Covenants are life-affirming and life-saving because the truth is we need each other. We hold each other's well-being in our hands and in our actions, and this is not a burden but an incomparable gift. It's why we love. It's why we create enduring friendships. It's why someone's art can stir another's heart. It's why we gather in religious community and are deeply held and changed by its presence in our lives. Just like that quilt that hangs in my office, our UU principles reflect our fundamental interdependence and the role that covenant plays as a North Star, a guide for how we live and our commitments. So Sage, you asked earlier what it meant to be um, in covenant with someone. And a covenant is like an agreement, like how we want to be with each other. So what's an agreement you could make with like a friend? Um, we agree to be nice to each other and try our best. So be nice to each other and try your best? Yeah. <laughs> and what about what's an agreement or a way you want to be with your family? Uh, I want to love them and get things on their birthday. Love them and get them things on their birthday? You're so sweet. So what happens if someone like breaks the covenant. What happens if you and your friends agree that you're going to be nice to each other and you're going to have nice words with each other and then one of you doesn't have nice words with each other? Then what happens? How do we come back into covenant or come back into agreement? Um, you can say I didn't like it, that. You can, can you please take it back? Okay, so you can ask them to take their words back. Okay. Or we can also ask them, hey, what you said hurt me. Can you be more mindful next time about the words that you use? Huh? Okay. So it's not always easy, right, when we make an agreement with someone to keep it? Do you agree with that or do you think it's always easy? Um, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, so when you were younger, <laughs> one of the things I said to you is that I would agree and covenant with you to use a nice voice right and not yell <laughs> when I'm upset but the other day I was really upset because I was having a hard day and I went to say something to your brother and sister and instead of just saying it mommy yelled was that nice of me no no right because I had agreed right to use a nice voice and I yelled, and but after I sat and I thought about it, I came back to them and I said, you know what, I'm sorry. Mommy agreed to use a nice voice with you and I didn't do that. So I broke my covenant with them, right? Yeah. So I apologized and explained that I was having a rough day, but that was not a good reason for me to break covenant with them. 
And we talked about it, and I apologized. And I said, I'm going to try moving forward to use my nicer voice, right? Yeah. Do you think that was good? Uh-huh. And how do you think they felt? Uh, I think they felt proud of the mommy. You were pr- they were proud of their mommy? Yeah. Yeah. And so they said, I'm glad that you recognized and you came to us and you said something about the way you were behaving. But sometimes we don't always n- notice that we've broken covenant, right? Yeah. So maybe I came and I'm yelling at you and screaming at you, but then I don't ever come back and apologize. Then what happens? You break the covenant. I broke the covenant. But So could you say something to me about breaking the covenant? Yeah. What could you say to me? Oh, I say you broke the covenant. Can you please fix it? Okay, so you can tell me I broke the covenant, and can I please fix it? And how, in that case, would I fix it? I might say sorry, or sorry I yelled. Uh, I tried to not do it. Oh, that's nice. I'd say sorry I yelled, and I'm going to try in the future to not do that again. Yeah. Do you think it's good to have a covenant or an agreement with each other? Yeah. Why? Um, because if you break it, you learn from your mistakes. Because when you break covenant, you learn from your mistakes. Yeah. That's great advice, Sage. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bradshaw, when we think about being in covenant with one another, what do you think of? I think of an agreement with peers that allows you to come to a better understanding of each other. So what happens if we break covenant? Um, I know you had a situation with a friend where you all had an agreement about how you treat others and one of your friends deviated from that covenant. So how do we work on coming back into covenant with one another? I would talk to them, explain to them what they did wrong, try to come to an understanding and work together to figure out a solution. All right, so talking about it. And do you think that when we break covenant with one another that it is possible? to come back into covenant with with one another? I believe that it is possible, not all the time, maybe. Some people seem to not want to go into a sort of agreement, but for the people who are willing to change for the better, then yes. Yeah, I agree. Like, everyone within that group or within that community must want to be in a covenantal relationship in order for it to be um, successful. But as you said, if everyone is in agreement with the covenant, and works to you know uphold the covenant and come back into covenant then i think it's something that can be successful in a multitude of situations would you agree yeah for activities you can follow august and lori outside and the rest of us will sing one verse of this little light of mine This we know, we belong to each other. In 1963, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. articulated this truth from a narrow cell in Birmingham, Alabama. In his now famous letter from a Birmingham jail, King shared his sense of disappointment with white moderate clergy who condemned the tactics of nonviolent direct action to confront the racist police violence, segregation, and Jim Crow laws of Birmingham. In that letter, King called us all to a deeper knowing of our interdependence, 
writing, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. King offered this soaring image along the backdrop of lament, frustration, and disappointment at the clergy who preach the values of equality, but in the moment of need and opportunity for real and material change in the lives of black Americans, condemned King. I imagine on a personal level that all of us know this feeling of disappointment and anger at being let down by those who you thought were with you and would show up alongside you in your moment of need. It's painful. And right now, we are all experiencing layers of this deep personal, social, and collective lament. As a religious community, we know these things to be true, that no one is outside the circle of love, that every person has worth and dignity, that love and compassion are the foundation for the world we need. We know this, and yet everywhere we see these values forsaken. For decades, we have witnessed the erosion of bonds of care, compassion, and shared investment in community. In just the 46 years of my lifetime, we've witnessed devastating rise of inequality, poverty, and indebtedness in the U.S. Alongside this has been the escalation of policing and mass incarceration and the criminalization of poverty. For more than a decade, we've witnessed the explicit political embrace on the right of dehumanizing and divisive rhetoric and policy rooted in racism, xenophobia, patriarchy, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia. For years, we've experienced the growth of propaganda and disinformation. And now we are living with the direct impacts of this rhetorical and policy violence in the banning of books and the silencing of history, in the suppression of voting rights, in the caging of children, and in the vigilante violence and growing support of an authoritarian, anti-democratic, white supremacist movement in the United States. And it is against this backdrop in the US that the COVID-19 pandemic began. And repeatedly, repeatedly we have lost ground as we've responded to this virus through individualism, capitalism, and nationalism. Whether it is the refusal to wear masks out of some distorted notion of individual freedom or locking down borders in ways that betray racist assumptions to treating essential workers as expendable to failing repeatedly to put global vaccination ahead of profits. We continue to fail in our responsibilities to each other. We live in a web of interdependence, whether or not we wish it so. And suffering thrives where the bonds of our relationships are defined by exploitation and domination. In the US, the coronavirus has thrived along historic and systemic fissures of disparity and racism and poverty. Fissures that have long defiled our social bonds. The impacts of these choices is that this virus has taken nearly a million lives in the US and caused so much isolation, despair, and trauma for all of us, but especially for those who are already impacted by systemic inequity and oppression. The layers of trauma, the layers of lament are deep. And in our own UU community, we've seen this disparity we have lost so many young black leaders, not just to the pandemic, but to the stress of these times. The deep lament is because the crisis of this pandemic alongside the crisis of global climate change of which the two are not unrelated, 
actually creates the necessity and the opportunity to draw humanity together for collective action to save lives and protect the future of our species. But again and again, we've chosen to double down on division, nationalism, profits, and a deadly status quo. Now to be clear, I'm not pointing back to some golden day that never was. What we need is to chart a new way forward rooted in covenant, rooted in an understanding of our fundamental belonging and our responsibilities to one another. King understood this when he reminded us that we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. It is why it is so important to understand that the crises we face today are not just economic or political or social or even environmental. They are fundamentally spiritual and moral crises, reflective of the ways that the threads of connection that bind us have been defiled by greed and exploitation. And the tools we need, the tools we need to reweave these bonds are compassion, deep solidarity, mutuality, and care. These are defining times. It matters that we root ourselves in deep care for one another and a courageous commitment to the struggle for justice and thriving for everyone and for our shared future. After all, our religious communities are not social clubs. Our theology, our commitment to covenant is not an intellectual exercise. It is a call to a way of living and being. It is a call to action. This is no time for a casual faith, no time for a casual commitment to one another and the values of human dignity, justice, and compassion that we hold dear. And this is no time to go it alone. Practicing covenant reminds us that it is an act of faithfulness to continue showing up for and with one another. It is an act of faithfulness to continue to center care in how we live in the midst of division. This is a time where we need greater courage and greater solidarity and a deeper commitment to the well being of all people and all communities. We need investments that address poverty, climate change, and that invest in democracy and in human flourishing. Whenever I hear King's words that we are tied in a single garment of destiny, I imagine humanity is a collection of brilliant stars held together across the fabric of the expansive night sky, holding promise for what can be when we understand that we belong to each other and that we share responsibility for one another. I also remember our own universalist forebears who believed in universal salvation, but also knew that hell was something that existed here in this life fostered by systemic injustice. And our work as a people of faith is to love the hell out of this world, to join our efforts to work for a world where the web of life is infused with care, with peace, with justice, with compassion and equity, such that all people can thrive in their wholeness. May it be so. I'm Charlotte Kendall, a member of this worship team and congregation. We invite you into the practice of generosity. Your financial support allows the many ministries of the First Unitarian Church of Orlando to thrive. You can make an offering online to support the many ministries of this congregation. Simply go to Orlando U org and click the donate button in the upper right corner send a text or mail a check 
You may support this month's Share the Plate partner, the Healthcare Center for the Homeless, by finding a link to their organization in our weekly newsletter. Please let us know you donated by dropping a line to Gabby, our program assistant. The offertory song is called We're All Connected, written by Wendy Luella Perkins, sung by Wendy Luella Perkins, and Leah Morris. As willing and able, I invite you to sing along. We're all connected, bird cloud and tree. We're all connected, earth, wind, and sea. We're all woven in a single garment of destiny. We're all connected, breath, you and me. We're all connected, bird, cloud, and tree. We're all connected, earth, wind, and sea. Woven in a single garment of destiny. We're all connected, breath, you and me. When Covenant Breaks. When Covenant breaks, hope flickers, and doubt seeps in like floodwaters through the cracks in the basement. While the many return to the comforts of their congregation, we are left staring at the door that was slammed in our faces, wondering if we should walk back in and why. Our faith demands growth demands inclusion of those who are never like us, whatever side of that us you fall on. But words can so easily be cast aside in the moment when they matter. Covenant is a promise that we will work together on a team we didn't choose. Doing group work we like the idea of far more than the thing itself. It is the radical answer to a radical goal, at least on paper. For our faith does not give us answers for what to do when covenant breaks. When we see that some would rather cling to their patriarchy and their white supremacy, would make problem people of the whistleblowers and hateful radicals of those just asking for rights. Would pretend that the promises of covenant mean nothing unless the person is just like you. But then, standing in that cold with that door slammed in front of you, something shifts.
covenant is a promise between the people of this faith. But it is also a promise between ourself and our faith. And sometimes nothing takes more faith than staying. Choosing to speak of your broken heart to those who are brave enough to face change. To stay in dialogue and have those hard conversations you never wanted to have. And choosing to be angry rather than walk away. All of these are holding true to your promises. When covenant breaks, we are sent back to the beginning again, like a toddler on their time out to think about what just happened, or a minister on their sabbatical call to remember what we fell in love with in the first place. This ship is not sinking. It is only rocked by the violent waves of oppression, and everyone has contributed to the oppression of someone, if not everyone. May that humility keep us listening, even when our own pain hasn't been heard yet. Even when our relationships are shattering like crystals falling to cold stone, even when all you need is a hug and your community won't open its arms yet. When covenant breaks, we need to come home to trust. To trust that there are others out there who would have supported you if they were only there. And to trust that our faith will always be here tomorrow, bound by nothing more or less than the promises made by people willing to fight. Like a golden web glimmering with dew in the first light of morning, because when covenant breaks, it is a tear merely in a web still holding strong. And as long as we believe in ourselves and in the greatness that we could become together, then we can always come back tomorrow, roll up our sleeves and start weaving again. When I invite you to hold silence with me, I'm not instructing you to hold still in fact, you might rise in body or in spirit, or you might shift your position, whatever helps you turn your body and your heart into the most receptive vessels possible. It might even help if you want to hold something like a chalice so that its weight reminds us that even silence can be sacred. So if you find that your mind gets very, very restless, you might remember that one purpose of silence is to notice and observe. Another purpose could be to prepare ourselves for the singing and the prayer and the work ahead to till that receptive ground. Another purpose might be just to take in everything that's been offered so far. And it might be easier knowing that we're doing it together. However you make yourself comfortable, please share some silence with me.
if you have found any gift in this brief silence. May we remember that those gifts are available to us, not just right now, but in the days ahead. I'm Patty Reynolds from the Caring Circle. If you would like to contribute to our sharing of joys or concerns, you can send an email to joysandconcerns at orlandouu.org during the week so we may share it on Sundays. Additionally, if you are attending the service in person, you can also fill out a card at the registration table and hand it to an usher before service. For those attending, online, I invite you to write the name of a person that you hold in your heart today in the chat box. We have three announcements today. Four, actually. Winona Winnie Tyler, a former member of One U, who was instrumental in bringing about the Haiti Night fundraiser at our church years ago, suffered a major stroke recently. She's currently under hospice care at the Gardens of Depew Nursing Home in Winter Park. Family members have traveled to say their goodbyes. Medical staff say it's a matter of days or weeks before she completes the transition from this life. Winnie spent her life in the service to others helping to care for many in India with a group associated with Mother Teresa, as well as what has been her main focus on helping the pe people of Haiti. She truly is a gift to humanity. Today, Linda and Dave Shine are celebrating the 40th wedding anniversary. Congratulations, how wonderful. Linda and Dave also announced their son, Michael, is now the public information officer for the town of Fulton, Missouri. Gabby would like to thank our amazing volunteers who have signed up to be part of the Adopt a Precinct program this year. We're excited they will get to help voters exercise their right to vote for this year's important midterm elections. All of us have hearts full of holes where arrows have landed. And all of us at some time or another have been the person who inflicted that hurt on someone else. How many times and in how, how many ways can you think of the times that you have felt stung, that you felt a relationship been torn asunder and how hard is it, is it to take the armor off and to do that vulnerable work of seeking repair of asking forgiveness of extending trust once again or of naming the things that we need from each other in order to begin that work of returning and returning and returning. Whatever the word prayer means to you, however you understand it, I invite you to pray with me. Help us say yes, spirit of loving mystery. Help us say yes first to our own selves and to tending the wounds and the disappointments that have been inflicted on us for whatever reason. Yes to our worthiness. Yes 
to our hope in human relationships and returning to one another instead of turning away. For those of us who know that we have caused hurt, may we not be stuck in shame or in guilt, but may we loosen our own armor so that we can fully understand the hurt we've caused, seek ways to avoid those paths of wounding, and have the humility to want to try again in more loving ways. Mysterious love, often we are bystanders. Often we witness pain being tossed between two people or more. May we be willing to be custodians and guardians of love. May we interrupt when interruption is called for. May we call people to their fullest selves. May we name oppression when we witness it. But may we each be a member of community and of cohesion and of connection that calls people to accountability, but also to love, where we say yes to one another where we say yes to that which is life-giving, yes to repair, yes to love in action that looks like the earning of trust and the guarding of trust. May we remember that our communities are woven through our speech and our actions and our trust and our teamwork. And may we keep showing up to do that sacred, holy work so that we can say yes to one another to carry one another forward. May it be so for our relationships that are virtual, that are in person, that are chosen, and the relationships that are part of the yes we said long ago to being part of Unitarian Universalist community. You say yes to us love and life and may we keep saying yes to one another as a means of saying yes back to you may it be so as long as I have breath, I must answer yes to life. Though with pain I made my way, still with hope I meet each day. If they ask what I did well, tell them I said yes to life. As long as vision lasts, I must answer yes to truth in my dream and in my dark. Always that elusive spark. If they ask what I did well, tell them I said yes to truth. La del corazón Debo decir si al amor Me dolió la decepción Y aún así te di el perdón Si preguntan que hice bien Diles dijo si al amor As long as 
As my heart beats, I must answer yes to love. Disappointment pierced me through. Still, I kept on loving you. If they ask what I did best, tell them I said yes to love. A spark of the holy can never be extinguished. Our chalice flame lives on each week in the very marrow of our bones, in the sparks of creativity and the glimmers of love which infuse and invigorate the best moments of our day to day. May we carry that light onward as we go forth as the symbol of our chosen faith, which recalls us to the sacred promises of our covenant as we close our sacred time and extinguish this physical chalice flame. Please join me in the words of our chalice we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. We are not alone, though sometimes we forget that truth. We are woven into one cloth, one gorgeous blanket, designed for use, for comfort, to sustain and to love. And each and every day this world advertises the potential of our shared beauty. It is there for the taking for the making, for the weaving. In this moment, here together, we remember that we are the woven and also the weavers. Each of us rooted in generations and stretching towards the future. Held by communities and beholden to them. Seeking wholeness and sought by life's desire for itself. Loving the world and beloved so much more than we realize. Part of the web of the beautiful blanket of creation.